afternoon, Jennifer, and welcome to our ninth episode of Making Reproductive Longevity a Reality. So I'm Jong here, a clinician scientist in Zapsangani, with my research focus is on unraveling the biology of ovarian follicle genesis in the hope to change the irrevocability of reproductive aging in women. I'm Jennifer Garrison. I'm a faculty member at the Buck Institute in Nevada, California. I'm also the faculty director for the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality. So the GCRLE, as we like to call it, is uh, really geared towards trying to alter the societal balance toward equality for women by understanding what leads to menopause and hopefully enabling scientists to discover interventions that will slow or reverse it. Um, we really think that every aspect of a woman's life is influenced by the fact that she goes through this reproductive decline in midlife, um, and we'd like to we'd like to intervene. Um, so this webinar series, as you know, if you've tuned in before, is designed to highlight some of the research that we've funded. Um, so today we're featuring two spectacular talks from GCR Lee grantees on important topics that are related to female reproductive aging. And both of these talks have to do with oocyte quality. Um, we've talked before about just how complex ovarian tissue is. Um, our first speaker is going to talk about how changes in the physical environment around the developing egg changes with age, and specifically how fibrosis or actual changes in the physical stiffness of the ovary might be affecting oocyte quality. Um, our second speaker is going to talk about a truly exciting preclinical study to test a drug candidate that might actually help increase the number of healthy eggs uh, a woman has later in life. Um, and she's going to talk about a model that's a little bit closer to what we observe in humans. Remember, we've, we've discussed this, I think, back on episode four, that you know, laboratory mice are a wonderful um, model, but they don't show uh, decreased reproductive capacity with aging that's quite like humans. Um, they do go through a decline, but it, it's not like a true menopause, uh, which is what we see in humans. And Zhang Wei, I know you've, uh, you've probably seen uh, yeah. examples of what ovaries look like uh, in young versus old women. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, during gynecological surgeries, it's always interesting to just, you know, when we're doing surgeries, we observe the ovaries because that's what our specialty looks at. And it's how interesting that, you know, from a younger woman, when she's pre-menopause, the ovaries are nice, round, and supple. And, and, and when she, a menopause woman, when we do the surgery, and you look at the ovaries, they are literally shrunken and aged, likened to a dry prune. You know, I was just thinking, is there any way that we could rejuvenate this ovary? You know, do we make it look like, you know, uh, what plastic surgery does? Plump it up, you know? put in things and, and it goes back to its normal shape and size and, and things will change. So I think this really nicely brings on to our speaker that I'm going to introduce Nick. I would like to introduce uh, Farnas, who is our uh, speaker to start off with. She's a reproductive biologist and she's currently a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Francesca Duncan Laboratory uh, in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Northwestern University. Uh, Farnas is interested in understanding how age-associated changes in the ovarian and microenvironment shape reproductive function. So I think this is uh, wonderful, and I would like to invite now Farnas on to share with what she finds you know, in the ovaries and how we can do something about it. Hello, good afternoon, and good morning, Singapore. Um, so I'm going to share my... Uh my slides now. And before I start, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Jennifer and Levin from the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality, as well as the, the National University of Singapore for this opportunity to present my, uh, my research on female reproductive uh, aging. So today I will be talking about targeting fibrosis and inflammation to extend reproductive uh, longevity. Uh, so, um, lifespan is uh, defined as the length of time for uh, which a person lives, and in average, in the United States, is 79 years. However, from these 79 years, we only live in a healthier status 63 years, which is what we know as the health span. And in the last decades, a lot of uh, the scientific community has been uh, working to try to extend lifespan as well as uh, health span. But one of the, of the system that has been understudied is the female reproductive system. So um, we all know here that the uh, ovary is one of the male uh, organs of the female reproductive system, and it basically has two main functions. 
The first one is the production of these high quality eggs that will be fertilized to ensure the next generation of human beings. And the second uh, function is the production of the ovarian hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And probably outside our uh, reproductive uh, biology field, uh, it's uh, much, it's more um, known the, the production of these eggs than the production of the hormones from the ovary. But they are equally important because they not only regulate the menstrual cycle, but they also regulate many down, uh, many extra ovarian tissues such as the brain, the heart, and the bones. So the female reproductive system is the first to age, and in this uh, in this graph, you we represented the kinetics of aging of different uh, of different tissues in the human body, and we can clearly see in this uh, red line that the female fertility per fertility performance declines decades prior to any other organ in the human body. So, what are the clinical consequences of this early um, uh, aging? The first one is the reduction of the number and quality of follicles that will be translated with a, an increase of um, infertility problems if women after 34 years old. And the second one is a decrease in ovarian hormones that will accelerate the biological aging of women. So if we now come back to this, uh, to this graph, it's uh, clear that we were missing a key uh, parameter in this equation that is the reproductive span. So if we want to extend half the span, we really need to extend reproductive span because as I said before, uh, menopause is it's, um, associated with uh, an accelerated biological aging. And how we think we can uh, do this or we should approach this. So first thing is that we need to characterize and understand the changes in the ovary with age to then propose interventions to delay reproductive aging and improve women's health. Much research has been done in the last decades to understand how the quality, the quality of the oocyte de decreases with age, but this oocyte is not found in isolation in the, in the ovary. It's found in the follicle, which is the functional unit of the ovary. And in the ovary, this, uh, this follicle is surrounded by a complex tissue that is the stroma or the ovarian microenvironment. And in these two images that are from uh, ovarian sections from a reproductively young and a reproductively old mice, we can see that clearly there is a decrease in follicles with age, but also that this tissue that surrounds a follicle changes in morphology and also in amount. So in the Duncan lab, we want, we want to understand what are the changes in this tissue because as they surround the follicles, we think that they can impact the quality of these oocytes. And uh, the, the model that we use is the, is the mice, and uh, particularly we use this a strain that is the CV6F1 because it's a model of physiologic aging. We use mice at two different ages, the reproductively young mice that they have between 6 and 12 weeks, and they are the human equivalent of early 20s, and uh, reproductively old mice that they have between 14 and 17 months, and they, uh, it's the human equivalent of late 30, early 40s. And we know that this, uh, these mice they have a low number and quality of the meats. They have an astroma that contains high fibrosis, produce AMH level, and uh, also they have subfertility with age. So I said before that we are interested in the stroma. So what is the stroma? Despite it's the most abundant subcompartment of the ovary, we know relatively few information about the stroma. We know that it's, uh, it's formed by several cell types like the smooth muscle cells, thicker cells, and, um, and immune cells, and it's enriched in the extracellular matrix. So the extracellular matrix or ECM is the major compartment of the cellular microenvironment. It's a complex network of proteins, for example, collagen and carbohydrates, and it's very dynamic. So this compartment can be assembled, disassembled, and, and change in composition and morphology. And all these changes that occur at the external part of the cell will be sensed by the cell because the cell has cell receptors and will change the behavior of the cell in terms of gene expression, morphology, stem cell differentiation. Therefore, everything that happens outside the cell will have a, an impact in the behavior of this cell. So we know that fibrosis or the excess of collagen deposition is a hallmark of aging tissues, and the ovary is not an exception. 
You can see in these two ovarian tissue sections from a reproductively young mice and a reproductively old mice that we stain for collagen one and three. And collagen, you can see it here in, in red. And clearly the red staining increases in reproductively old mice. We then uh, perform another uh, uh, assay to validate that there is an increase of collagen content, as you can see that collagen increases with aging in these ovaries. Therefore, the ovary uh, shows signs of fibrosis earlier than any other organ examined. In some tissues, uh, fibrosis is associated in tissue stiffness, and we wanted to explore uh, if this was also the case in the ovary. And the way that we, we did this is to use the instrumental indentation. So basically, we have a microscope that is attached to a proof, and in this proof, we indented the ovary at several positions. And from these indentations, we obtain graphs like this one, where we can see the indentation and the force that this proof needs to perform in the ovary to be indented. We then apply the Hertz uh, model, and we can obtain the stiffness or the young modulus of this tissue. When we perform these experiments with reproductively young ovaries and uh, ovaries from reproductively old mice, we could clearly see that the stiffness increases with reproductive aging. So we, the next obvious question was, um, is this increase of tissue stiffness of, uh, of fibrosis inducing tissue stiffness? And to answer this question, what we did is to isolate ovaries from reproductively old mice, and we treated them with collagenase. This collagenase treatment is an enzymatic solution that eliminates the collagen, and then we perform analysis of the, of the ovary biomechanical properties. But first, we check that we were able to reduce the amount of collagen. As you can see in this graph, we see that old ovaries contain more collagen compared to the young ones. But when we treated these old ovaries with collagenase, we were able to uh, decrease the amount of collagen to similar levels to the young ovaries. And you can clearly see here this change in the red color in these old collagenase treated ovaries compared to the old controls. We then indented these ovaries. And as expected, we found that old ovaries are stiffer compared to the young ones, but these old ovaries that were treated with collagenase, we were able to restore this soft environment that is characteristic from the uh, young ovary. Therefore, collagen contributes to the increase of ovarian stiffness with physiologic aging. But what are the functional consequences of this increase on ovarian stiffness? And to answer this question, we are currently using a very powerful uh, technique that is uh, encapsulated in vitro follicle growth assay. So from mice, uh, we can isolate uh, um, early secondary follicles and encapsulate them in alginate gels and culture them in vitro. And you can see here these early secondary follicles that they have been cultured in vitro. And why it's so powerful, this technique, it's because we can culture these follicles for 12 years in vitro and not only analyze follicle parameters, which are uh, follicle growth, survival, morphology, and estradiol production, but we can also induce ovulation and uh, perform in vitro fertilization and study the early embryo developments of these um, fertilized oocytes. So using this technique, uh, we can uh, encapsulate these follicles with different uh, percentages of alginate gel that will represent a more stiff or soft environment. And uh, we realize that with a stiffer environment, the, the follicles grow less, they produce less uh, embryos, and they also produce less estradiol compared to the soft environment. So we know that for a successful IVF treatment, the quality of the oocyte is essential. And, but these results show us that the environment in, this, uh, in which these oocytes uh, are developing will have a clear uh, impact on the quality of these oocytes. But then we explore if this was only happening in mice or we were observing this, uh, this uh, pattern also in humans. And we created a tissue microarray that consisted of 120 human ovarian tissue uh, samples from different women at different ages. And when we stain these samples with collagen, we clearly see that there is an increase of collagen content. So what we describe in the mice also happened in humans. 
So fibrosis is preceded with inflammation and our lab also demonstrated that in the aging uh, stroma, there is an infiltration of multi multinucleated giant macrophages and an increase of an inflammatory response in the stroma as shown by an increase of DNA alpha and the production of AL6. So now uh, we characterize that with this, uh, with reproductive aging, there is an increase of fibrosis and, uh, and inflammation in the ovary. So the next question was, can we target fibrosis and inflammation to extend reproductive longevity and improve women's overall health? In other words, we know that at seven months, it's when in mice, fibrosis and inflammation starts. Can we delay the reproductive age-associated onset of fibrosis and inflammation to regenerate, rejuvenate the, the ovary. And the way that we do that is uh, we selected two different drugs. One is an antifibrotic drug that is a pyrfenidone that is a broad spectrum antifibrotic drug and is currently used for the treatment of the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And the second drug is an anti-inflammatory drug uh, that is an AF6 receptor inhibitor and is used to treat the rheumatoid arthritis. And the approach that we use is an in vivo approach. So we use mice at seven months of age and also an osmotic pump. So basically we, um, we fill this pump with our drugs and these pumps will be implanted in the mice and will release these drugs uh, constantly at the same rate for several days, even several weeks. And the approaches that we will use first is the systemic delivery. So we will implant this, uh, this pump subcontinuously and they will be um, releasing the drug for several days in the whole body of the mice. But the second approach will be that we will um, uh, attach a catheter to this pump that will target directly the ovary and will only release these drugs in the ovary. So how will be the experimental approach? So we will start with mice at seven months of age, that is when fibrosis and inflammation starts, and we will have four groups. Mice that will be controlled, an antifibrotic group, an anti-inflammatory group, and also the combination of fibrosis and anti-inflammatory uh, uh, drugs. And for each of these groups, we'll have a systemic delivery or a uh, targeted delivery. These mice will be treated for six weeks, and after these six weeks will be the end of the treatment, and we will obtain some of these mice. Some a set of mice will continue two more months, and uh, the final set of mice will be continued for uh, two more months, so four months until the end of the treatment. The next question will be uh, to determine whether this treatment, antifibrotic and or anti-inflammatory drugs can mitigate the associated ovarian fibrosis and inflammation. How we will do that? So we will uh, isolate the ovaries and we will measure the amount of collagen, the structure of the collagen. We perform uh, gene expression arrays and also we will profile the shift of the microphages from anti-inflammatory to a pro-inflammatory uh, profile. And the second point will be to evaluate whether these antifibrotic and anti-inflammatory treatments can delay reproductive aging and improve overall health. And we will measure these parameters by performing follicle counts, profile the astrocyclicity, measure the AMH levels, and analyze the bone's mineral density. Because we know that menopause is associated with osteoporosis, so uh, determining the, the bone mass density is a, a really good result of uh, overall health. So I would like to finish my presentation saying that with, uh, with uh, this grant from the Global Consortium for Productive Longevity and Equality will allow us to establish the first in vivo preclinical model using mice to test novel therapeutic approaches to extend reproductive longevity and improve women's health. And while our, um, our field starts to advance in uh, identifying pathways that change with, uh, with, uh, with aging, we hope that we can use this system to test uh, novel therapeutic approaches. And with this, I want to uh, give a special uh, thank you to my fantastic uh, postdoctoral mentor, Francesca Duncan, as well as all the members of the Duncan, of the Duncan Lab for their support and help and uh, all our collaborators. Thank you so much, Farners. That was wonderful. Super interesting. Um, so for everyone in the audience, we are going to reserve uh, questions to the end. So if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we will talk to both Dr. Zielinski uh, and Dr. Farners, uh, our 
uh, Armengan uh, at the end. Um, so I am really delighted to introduce our second speaker, Mary Zielinski. Um, uh, she received her bachelor's degree from the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison, her master's and her PhD from Oregon State University. Uh, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Oregon National Primate Research Center, and she's currently a professor in the Division of Reproductive and Developmental Sciences at Oregon National Primate Research Center and in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, and I will say that Mary is really a leader in the field. Um, her research is focused around trying to understand the development and the function of uh, primate ovarian follicles, really towards the application um, in important areas of women's reproductive health. So over 30 years, she has been using non-human primate models of infertility and contraception. And now we've been very lucky to uh, to attract her, to, to focus her attention on the, the very important question of reproductive aging. So she's currently working on optimization of ovarian tissue cryopreservation for fertility and cancer survivors, and also an understanding dynamics of follicle activation and development over the lifespan to investigate interventions or drugs for ovarian aging. Um, and I, I just wanna say that, you know, um, Mary is, just amazing. She's the four-time recipient of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine uh, program prize paper. She is an invited speaker at many meetings. I have invited her to speak at meetings. She's got numerous publications and she served on the board of directors for the Society for the Study of Reproduction. And she received the Distinguished Service Award from them in 2014. She's also the incoming co-editor-in-chief of Biology of Reproduction, the journal. Um, and separately from all of that, Mary is really passionate about bringing science to the public, and she directs educational outreach activities, and I can tell you firsthand that she is a fantastic teacher. I have been the, benef I've been the beneficiary of some of her really great teaching, um, and today she's going to talk about uh, work that she's doing using a model of menopause that's relevant to humans um, to test a potential drug for ovarian aging. So welcome, Mary. Thank you so much for that very, very kind introduction. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the participation of everyone in Singapore. It's quite an honor to be here today. Our project that has been recently funded by the GCRLE called Interventions for Reproductive Aging. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-investigators, Dr. Stephen Kohama and Dr. Afam Okoye at the Primate Center. And we've enlisted a couple of collaborators uh, because I'm relatively new to aging research. So Dr. Kevin Flurkey from Jackson Labs and also uh, Dr. Kara Goldman is our clinical infertility expert helping guide us on this project. And I can't advance, let's see. So um, our group recently was convened to um, talk about what should be the priorities for infertility research. And this included um, people from the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, as well as the European Society for Human Reproduction and Embryology. And right at the very top of the list is, can age-related infertility be, pre be prevented? Um, there are a couple others under the priority. Can we have a predictive model for um, ovarian reserve and, um, can we help women manage their reproduction uh, prior to aging? So this is a very, very important priority around the world. We know that more women over 30 are giving birth um, than in past generations. So this has increased from 36 to 47% over the past 20 years or so. And 90% um, of women want to achieve their personal goals before getting pregnant. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists advise that all women should think about whether or not they would like to have children, and if so, when to have them, and to develop their own reproductive life plan. There is a gap in awareness among millennials who um, don't believe that many women struggle with um, 
infertility over the age of 35. And when asked if this was true or false, 90% of women over 40 struggle with fertility. 90% of them answered that question incorrectly. So education needs to occur to um, help everyone understand their reproductive lifespan. And we know that 60% of the total in vitro fertilization population is now um, aging as well. So as Farners mentioned, reproductive lifespan, ovarian aging, and menopause encompass um, oocyte quality. Uh, the natural ability to conceive is decreased, and this occurs in women in their mid to late 30s. And worrying about oocyte quality leads us to help women establish their careers, or there may be some women who haven't found a partner uh, at that age in life. In addition, the lack of ovarian steroid hormones uh, ceases with menopause, and this has uh, consequences on many other tissues, as Farns has discussed as well. Um, I found this interesting fact, or figure actually, uh, over 400,000 IVF treatment cycles were analyzed. And regardless of the age of the patient, 15 oocytes seem to be the magical number for being able to get to achieve the pregnancy rate that is achievable at that particular age. So in a woman 40 years and older, she'll need 15 oocytes, but that still is only going to give her a 15% chance of a pregnancy. So um, these women would have to ha stockpile eggs from multiple stimulation cycles to get to that 15 oocyte sweet spot in order to achieve a live birth. Um, in another study of over 100,000 IVF patients, no patient between the ages of 45 and 49 achieved a pregnancy if they could only collect four, uh, less than four mature oocytes. So we are using the non-human primate model and consider this to be a really great animal model to study reproductive longevity. Because our uh, monkeys have menstrual and ovarian cycles identical to women and undergo natural menopause, we can obtain ovaries for research both in vivo and in vitro from healthy animals. The ovarian tissue is very similar to that um, in women in, in its structure and organization. We can obtain ovaries from various ages, from fetal life all the way through uh, reproductive aging. Their living environment is fairly uniform. They get the same diet, they have the same housing and care, and or we can experimentally manipulate it. We have on board for the past 25 years or so, all of the assisted reproductive technologies that will allow us to look um, at oocyte quality. And we don't have ethical concerns regarding the use of experimental reproductive technologies as we need to be concerned in women. Um, there are a number of facilities that are aiding us in this research. So Dr. Kohama heads the Primate Aging Studies Resource, resource which uh, maintains a cohort of aging non-human primates. Dr. Okoye's lab um, is involved in assessing immune function. Dr. Chavez is in our developmental biology department and has um, great ability to analyze time-lapse embryo imaging. Dr. Paul Kuvet um, is helping with metabolic um, outcomes in our primate imaging core. We can do DEXA scans. We have a wonderful department of surgery with clinical surgeons and technicians, as well as a division of com comparative medicine and all the people who take care of the daily care of our animals who are just amazing. We have an assisted reproductive technologies core, an endocrine core that can measure hormones, a pharmacology core that can measure drug levels and a, a histology core as well. So follicular development in primates involves the um, initiation of growth of the small cohort of follicles to the point where you would reach the antral follicle that can ovulate. And reproductive aging, uh, we have cessation of menstrual cycles and all of these small follicles in the beginning called the ovarian reserve disappear. And here are some images from rhesus monkey ovary showing you a uh, reproductively active ovary full of follicles and their depletion as these animals age. The hormone levels in our rhesus monkeys as they proceed from reproductive uh, function through menopause 
uh, follow the same patterns as are observed in women. So regular estradiol and progesterone uh, indicate regular uh, menstrual cyclicity. As the animals get to perimenopause, cycles start to become irregular, and then hormone production ceases at menopause. So in our colony, um, the our, our animals get to be irregular about age 22, and they reach menopause about age 25. Some of the other hormones that uh, indicate menopause or its onset are similar in monkeys as well. We see a decline in um, AMH production. And even while animals are having regular cycles, older animals will start to have a decline in AMH before their cycles uh, start to become irregular. So we are taking uh, longitudinal measurements from a number of animals um, over their reproductive aging process to see if we can come up with a nice predictor, at least in our animal colony, for when they will go into um, reproductive decline. So there is one difference between women and macaques. Um, macaques have a shorter lifespan after reaching menopause compared to women. So if we consider the average lifespan of a woman to be 80 years, about 38% of a woman's lifespan will be spent in a non-reproductive state or after the period after menopause. However, in macaques, in our colony uh, settings, they have a lifespan of about 25 years. Therefore, they really don't have a lot of time after menopause. And uh, you'd think chimpanzees and gorillas might be more similar to women, but actually the baboon is in this respect. This is a very busy graph, but I wanted to show you this because this is kind of the real world. This is showing you the reserve of follicles, non-growing follicles plotted against age. And we are born uh, so far with all the follicles we're going to have, and they decline uh, with age. And this um, model by Wallace and Kelsey shows us the 95% confidence interval in the variation on the number of of small primordial follicles that are observed at the different um, ages of a woman's lifespan. And this is uh, similar in our rhesus monkeys and a little bit different than what you would see in mice and inbred mice where things might be a lot uniform. So a woman who is uh, born with more primordial follicles will tend to go through menopause later than a woman who is born with fewer primordial follicles. Follicles have a couple of different fates. We start with our pile at birth, and then these can uh, begin to grow, and most of them die or become atretic. Um, there's continuing recruitment throughout life, and these follicles can then go on. One of them is selected every month. So we probably ovulate about 500 oocytes in our lifetime. And this continuing recruitment um, eventually le leads to depletion of the follicles. So big questions in the field are what initiates primordial follicle growth activation? What precipitates their loss with age? Are there intrinsic differences um, within each follicle? Are increasing hormone levels responsible or um, inhibitory influences are diminished from local follicles in their vicinity? Lots of questions need to be answered. Primordial follicle activation looks like this. Uh, the primordial follicle that's resting or dormant has flattened uh, pregranulosa cells around uh, surrounding the oocyte. And as it's activated, um, these cells become cuboidal. And among this wonderful population here in a rhesus monkey ovary are primordial follicles and some indicated here primary follicles. There's a transitional stage in between where the follicle has half flattened and half cuboidal cells. But the problem in all of this is we are currently unable to distinguish in this beautiful cohort of primordial follicles, which ones are dormant and which ones are gonna get ready to become a primary follicle. This is a complicated uh, process, and I will refer you to a very elegant review article written by another GCRLE 
um, grantee, Dr. Amanda Callen, who discusses the regulation of primordial follicle growth activation. And there are a number of factors shown to um, activate and inhibit primordial follicle growth. But I'm going to focus on just one today, a factor called mTOR, or the mammalian mechanistic target of rapamycin. Rapamycin is a compound that was discovered on Rapahui, an Easter island by a microbiologist who wanted to know why the islanders were resistant to tetanus. So he was collecting soil samples to look for different uh, compounds that might be um, able to suppress immune or infection function. And uh, the target of uh, rapamycin was not found for some 30 years later. So it is actually acts as a signal to integrate nutrient signaling, which regulates many processes in the cell, such as gene expression, cell growth and division, metabolism, ability to uh, clear damaged proteins and cell survival. And when uh, the cells are in a nutrient poor situation, a uh, process called autophagy, which helps rid the cell of these damaged proteins kicks in. So rapamycin um, was first considered to be undesirable because it had very, very strong immunosuppressive activities, but that is now uh, changed and it's used in the medical field to uh, be an immunosuppressant for organ transplantation. And it also has some anti-cancer activity. Uh, mTOR consists of two protein complexes that each have their own proteins associated with them. And the different um, rapamycin or rapalogs will have different specificity for each of the protein complexes of mTOR. So rapamycin and related compounds have been shown to increase lifespan or improve health in a number of um, organisms. Um, mice fed rapamycin even later in their life were able to increase their lifespan as well as their reproductive function. There are ongoing studies in marmosets uh, administering rapamycin daily, and these animals have now been treated for up to seven years, but I haven't seen any reports yet on reproductive function. And there are a few clinical uh, trials conducted in elderly volunteers, humans. Uh, they are in their 70s, and uh, because of that, we can't uh, know what the effects of rapamycin has on reproduction, but it seemed to have very positive effects on immune response in, in elderly human volunteers. So a pathway called the PI3 pathway, PI3K pathway is involved in follicle activation, and it is um, kicked off by a number of growth factors on the cell membrane. And upon activation of this uh, phosphorylation of this protein called AKT, effectors are activated, and one of them is mTOR. And when mTOR is activated, follicles are activated. There are um, a few studies showing that if you inhibit the negative regulators of mTOR, this will lead to um, an uh, overactivation of mTOR. And when that happens, follicle activation is greatly increased to the point where all of the primordial follicles in the ovary are depleted and the reserve is gone. So if the activation of primordial follicles from the dormant pool is the cause, then inhibitors of this pathway should protect the ovarian reserve and stop um, the depletion of follicles. So uh, there are some um, in vivo studies in animal models to show that mTOR stimulators increase the activation of primordial follicles. And when inhibitors of mTOR, such as rapamycin or other rapalogs, are administered, uh, this process of activation is suppressed. Rapamycin can extend reproductive lifespan in rodents by preventing activation of primordial follicles. And a wonderful experiment by Dr. Goldman showed also that uh, mice treated with chemotherapy who would normally be depleted of their primordial follicles when they're treated with rapalogs, they were able to protect their ovarian reserve. So we hypothesize that chronic rapamycin treatment might slow the rate of primordial follicle activation in aging monkeys, allowing a greater cohort of follicles from which healthy oocytes can be obtained 
at advanced ages. So if the rate of activation of primordial follicles can be controlled, maybe we can help um, aging women produce even a few more high quality eggs that can help lead to a live birth. So we uh, needed to figure out a dose of rapamycin to give and doing dose response studies in monkeys is very expensive. So fortuitously, we were at a retreat and Dr. Okoye at our center, we found out had already treated male rhesus monkeys with rapamycin and he could achieve um, circulating levels of rapamycin shown here that are on the order of what are seen in the older human cohorts in the clinical trials. Um, because we are going to be looking at ovarian function, that's a really long time for us to wait to know if rapamycin is really doing anything physiologically at the dose we're giving. So Dr. Okoye and his group found that there was a decline in the proliferation of CD8 memory T cells, which are a specific immune cell, but this slight immunosuppression did not have any adverse effect on the male monkeys. So um, by looking at CD8 cells, this will be a wonderful biomarker of rapamycin effectiveness in vivo in um, monkeys as we go along. So we are treating um, female rhesus monkeys, both a young group and an old group with rapamycin in this first round, using um, animals as their own control. We'll take out an ovary prior to rapamycin treatment and then one at the end. And in the second year, depending upon what we find out in the first year, we would like to um, have a more controlled experiment of three animals getting vehicle and three getting rapamycin. And these ages of um, old animals um, in our rhesus colony are equivalent to women between 35 and 45 years of age. So in removing these ovaries, uh, we need to count the primordial follicle reserve and compare the two. And during this time, we can also do ovarian stimulations to get oocytes for fertilization and embryo development to assess um, oocyte quality. So we know uh, some good news is that our um, initial treatment of rhesus monkeys with rapamycin, uh, we're getting the circulating levels that we want. So we have lots and lots of endpoints that we're looking at and um, including ovarian, um, embryonic, metabolic endpoints, immune endpoints, whole blood for DNA methylation and the microbiome as well. And um, to, to help get the most efficient uh, results from these very valuable animals. Um, and counting primordial follicles is not fun. Um, we've done it before, and uh, we've just published a little bit of this with Farnitz recently. And um, fortunately, Marilyn Coring, way back in 1983, found that there are similar numbers of primordial and preantral follicles between the right and left ovary. So using our female as our own control will help us account for the variability that may occur naturally in animals as is seen in women. Um, we're getting some more clues about what might be important in ovarian aging uh, from some recent studies. One was done uh, using cinemologous monkeys comparing young and old ovaries using um, single cell RNA seq to look at differences in gene expression with age. And what these researchers found was that primate ovarian aging is linked to a cell type specific downregulation of antioxidant proteins, particularly in the oocyte of both primordial and primary follicles, as well as upregulation of oxidative damage markers. So this might be a point of intervention as well. So there is a, an ongoing search for anti-aging pills, and the question is, will longevity and health span enhancers also extend reproductive lifespan? We can see perhaps the importance of antioxidants or rapamycin. Calorie restriction can also promote uh, longevity and reproductive um, the function as well. There are other factors that regulate protein home homeostasis, uh, cell senescence, vitamins can be part of this, and natural metabolites. A recent publication by uh, the Buck Institute has shown alpha ketoglutarate to be a health span um, um, effector as well. And perhaps we might need a cocktail of many of these agents.
So there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, so let's work together in all of our multiple animal models, combining our expertise in basic science and clinical practice. And maybe we can establish some um, common endpoints and priorities for making this work move forward in helping to identify novel intervention strategies to extend reproductive lifespan. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary, that was fascinating. Um, maybe I'll start with the first question. And for those of you in the audience, if you have questions for Mary or uh, for Farners, please put them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Okay, so Mary, inhibiting mTOR in the ovary, um, is that gonna result in a lower rate of primordial follicle activation or are you suppressing the follicle de uh, degeneration? Do you know? Our hypothesis is that it will um, suppress the activation based on research that's been done in, um, in rodents so far. But um, what really is controlling the rate? That's a really good question. And we'll need to see some more research to uh, see what those results might be. But um, we're thinking it will suppress activation and hopefully maintain a larger pool of follicles from which to choose a healthy oocyte. Yeah, it'll be really interesting. It might be both, right? Could be both, absolutely. Yeah. So um, a question from the chat from Pavla Brakova for Farners, um, but please, both of you chime in. Um, in the mouse model, does the ovarian bursa undergo aging and have contribution to the stiff environment that occurs independent of collagen deposition? This is an excellent question, Pavla. So um, like the bursa, it's like a membrane that surrounds uh, the ovary in rodents. And to perform our uh, stiffness measurements, uh, we have to isolate the, the ovary. So we remove the bursa. So I don't know like if the mechanical properties of the bursa will change with age. Um, and I'm not aware of any study that performed this. Uh, so I don't know if it changed probably changes because aging affects like the, all, all our uh, tissues and probably somehow it's also affecting the bursa, but uh, we still don't know because to do these measurements or we will have to isolate the bursa or measure in vivo the stiffness of these ovaries that are surrounded by the bursa. Yeah, that's quite it's... interesting. Yeah, um, because, you know, the, the lining around the ovary could, as you say, could be affected or could be just be very stuck through the multiple ovulation that women have in a lifetime or, or the organism. And, and that's another interesting from Daniel, uh, who actually asked you about the collagen level in the ovaries of young mice seems to be as high as that of the aged mice uh, in what he presented. So what roles do collagen have on the ovaries of young mice? And if it's considerably higher before decreasing in middle age, does it you know, change with, with age in the mice that you see? So in, the, in our uh, strain, uh, like uh, when we measure the collagen content from reproductively young and reproductively old mice, there is a, an, an increase of collagen and we measure in several assays and we can see this. Um, and, um, but this could be also that it's strain specific and also the ages. So one of the things that I would like to, to say is that, um, I don't know if you realize, but when I was presenting this data of the humans ovaries, uh, we were surprised, uh, to see that in, um, very young populations from zero to, to 10 age, they have, a. uh, a really amount of collagen that it's similar to reproductively old uh, collagen from old um, of old women, and we were surprised why this happens. So there is a high levels of collagen at the beginning; they go down at when there's a reproductive aging, and then when it's uh, when the women ages, it goes up again the collagen. And we have some hypotheses on that because in rodents, we know that uh, to maintain the, the primordial follicle ski essence, we need uh, the stiffness. So stiffness and collagen maintains the follicle ski essence. So this could be an explanation. And um, I don't know if I, I answer all the questions. I think. Yeah. The, the, yeah, there's one more. You're right, Jennifer. Yeah, do no, you go ahead. Ask? Yeah. Uh, this is something interesting because this is what I was saying, because we know the phenomenon of ovulation causing uh, multiple, you know, uh, inflammation points whereby the follicle rupture. And, but, and that's what uh, one of the attendees, Matthew, was asking. Could the fibrosis and collagen deposition be the result of repeated injury of follicle budding and healing by immune cells? 
since collagen is often deposited in wound healing and will birth control stops the cycle and then result in less fibrosis. So it's trying to ask you, will that intervention sort of reduce this risk? That is an excellent question. And we have this uh, question also that we would like to, to answer. So we know that obviously ovulation, it's a, it's a wound healing process. And this wound healing process, it's important to, to be at the position of collagen that then it has to be um, removed. But it's, it's a, one option is that all this process of ovulation at uh, when you are getting like old in, uh, in reproductively older, like there is an accumulation of this collagen from these uh, ovulation uh, processes. Um, we, unfortunately, from these human tissues that we have, we don't know if they, some of these um, uh, women were taking the birth control. So we couldn't assess using these tissues if this can impact to the collagen deposition. But it's an excellent question, and we are really um, very interested in, in examining this. Because it's true that the pill reduces the, the, the chances of ovarian cancer. So it's like, it's, it will be like really beautiful, like biologically to see that it can also reduce the amount of collagen that we can, uh, there is uh, this deposition in the ovary. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really amazing. And um, I think it's going to be incredibly useful to have this uh, culture system really um, that you've, I think, really optimized. Um, so let's see, coming back to Mary, um, thinking about, you know, well, if you can control, you know, the rate of early follicle activation to produce even a few high quality oocytes that would have a really dramatic impact on reproductive span in women. So um, Pavla asks uh, clinically, at what age are you envisioning treating women? Um, is this something that you could do at any age or is it something that would, you know, you think might be more beneficial at a particular age? That is a million dollar question for a number of reasons. <laughs> uh, follicles can last decades in a woman it, compared to, you know, just years in a mouse. And um, we really don't know if the cohort that is there of primordial follicles that is there in a 35 year old woman is um, if those oocytes, if they're all you know, of poor quality, and we're not going to be able to rescue them at all, um, or or not. Um, starting some of these health uh, and longevity enhancers late in the um, life of a mouse still seem to work, but we don't know what that threshold age will be for reproduction um, in a mouse or even a in a primate uh, using newer interventions? It's a great question. Um, doing those kinds of experiments in monkeys will be, you know, will take a long, long time. And we know that our most, most of our granting agencies only give us five years of funding. So to try to treat a 10 year old and then see what she's like at age 15 or 20, you know, that's gonna be difficult to do, not impossible, but uh, we'll just take money to be able to do that those kinds of experiments. So it's a great question, um, one that needs to be answered. And we've talked a lot about um, the link between ovarian dysfunction and metabolism in earlier webinars. And obviously mTOR is a master regulator for growth and um, all sorts of energy homeostasis. Um, so I'm curious, do you think that a specific RAPA logs, um, so analogs of rapamycin for those of you in the audience who don't think about this every day, do you think that specific RAPA logs might be useful um, to, to try to test for effects on reproductive aging? And then sort of a related question, um, are there specific isoforms of PI3 kinase that are important for follicle activation? I'm not sure about the isoforms that are needed. That's a good question. And um, Dr. Goldman tried different rapalogs um, in her experiments with the uh, chemotherapy treated mice using Everolimus and then Inc. 128. Um, Everolimus targets mTOR C1. Uh, like rapamycin and the INC 128 targets um, mTOR C2, and both of them worked equivalently. So um, it, I, again, if there are rapalogs that work better for extending health span in general, um, they might be the ones to use for future experiments as well. 
This is really exciting, isn't it, Jennifer? We are like talking about potential interventions, uh, you know, and, and we are still, there's so many time points that we're still not sure about. And I think Mary has provided so much insight into that. And basically uh, it, what I'm doing over here as well is trying to find that as, you know, that potential, what kind of uh, substances or, or potential interventions uh, that can actually be helpful. And, and I think I agree with what Mary has said and even what founders have shown, you know, in terms of collagen, uh, you know, that there must be some pathways that is involved and, and we are all here to try to identify that. Uh, things like antioxidants, you know, which Mary has also mentioned about, you know, maybe CoQ10, uh, if he was asking all of the question, uh, you know, I think there's so much more that we can uh, look into and I can't wait for your uh, studies to bear results and we can all collab together, isn't it, Jennifer? Yeah, there. I mean, there really are so many questions here. Um, yeah. I'm curious. So, Mary, do you have anything that you want to say to any scientists in the audience who, um, you know, were interested in any of those endpoints that you uh, flashed up on your slide? Uh, <laughs> because it, this is such a precious and um, valuable resource that you have, um, especially yes. for reproductive aging. Mm -hmm. We are all about sharing. We are a national resource, uh, all of the primate centers in the United States. And I personally totally believe in collaborations. So as I do serial sections in all of these ovaries um, with and without treatment, I'm going to have a lot of paraffin sections left over that I'm very willing to share with any one of you to check out your favorite uh, protein lo and localization in the ovary. Um, as well as collecting various samples as I listed there. So absolutely contact me and um, Steve and I can help work out some um, collaborations with you. We would love to do that. Wonderful. Yeah. And we have other questions. I know that um, you might also have more questions in the audience. Um, we're going to try to continue this conversation at gcrle.org um, over the next week or so. So if you have questions for either of our speakers, please go there. Um, and we really want to, we want to keep the dialogue going. And, um, you know, everything that we heard today is just so exciting. Um, so, I wanted to uh, encourage everyone. Today was our ninth web uh, webinar, and uh, we've only we're only going to do ten. So the last episode is going to be next week um, on April 29th, if you're in the West. April 30th, if you're in Singapore in the East, uh, we're going to have a really exciting panel discussion with thought leaders in the field. Um, so please join us to uh, hear Nicole Shanahan, who is the president of the Bia Echo Foundation. Uh, Professor Yap Sang Chong, who's the Dean of the National University of Singapore Yang Lu Lin School of Medicine and the Executive Director of ASTAR. Uh, Dr. Jun Yoon, who's the President and Managing Partner of Palo Alto Investors. And they're going to talk about, um, you know, the, the challenges and the opportunities that we face in building this ecosystem to reframe women's health. Um, they're also going to touch on some of the topics that we talked about today, how to facilitate and accelerate translating these basic scientific discoveries into useful products and therapies that we hope will impact in women's lives uh, soon. Um, so, Zhang Wei? Yes, and I want to thank all the attendees that have been following us all this while until the ninth episode. And I must thank Mary and Fanas who have always been with us silently as the attendees. You know, it's just amazing. And I'd like to sign off here with once again, making reproductive longevity a reality. And until our next episode, we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>